Well, this morning we're continuing our journey through the book of 1 Corinthians, and we come today to verse 9. Last week, we talked about the first eight verses, and we talked about the fact that Corinth, the church at Corinth, is so much like the church today, or probably even more accurately, our churches today, unfortunately, are so much like the church in Corinth. Now, the thing that Paul was disappointed in the Corinthians last week when we talked about was the fact that they had gone to worldly judges to settle conflicts among God's people. And Paul made it clear that worldly judges had no business trying to solve conflicts in the church of Jesus Christ. Well, when we come to verse 9 today and, and following, through the rest of the chapter, we find that the Apostle Paul is disappointed again. Because this time, not only had the church turned to worldly judges to settle church affairs, to try to settle conflicts, but the church had also turned to the world for direction in moral affairs. And we see the same thing today. Isn't it amazing that here in the church of Corinth, when all of a sudden the culture, the culture began to press in upon the church, Instead of the church influencing the culture, the culture influenced the church. And that's exactly what we have happening in our, in our world today. Instead of the church influencing the culture, instead, and when the, when the culture begins to rise up and be, and be different than the Word of God, live ap- apart from the Word of God, opposed to the Word of God, instead of the church rising up as a whole and saying, this must not be. Be reminded of the truth in so many ways in our country today, churches have caved to the culture. And what they were doing in those days, they were manipulating the message of grace to serve their own immoral desires. To the church in Corinth, the word grace had become the word permission. Since grace covers all of our sins, well, then we can go out and do all of our sins. We can just live any way we want to because grace has given us permission. And to hear the message from many of the pulpits today, that's what you're hearing. Grace covers all, so it doesn't matter that much how you live. I mean, we all fail, so big deal. So many of our churches today are taking the words that Paul mentioned concerning freedom and liberty and grace to mean that we can live any way that we want. Well, what Paul did in that day, we need to do today. He wrote to the church correcting their understanding of grace and freedom because he desired for them to be truly free, like we sang about today. Paul desired that they not only would be truly free, but they would take the opportunity, now that they had been set free from their old sins, to start over with a new life empowered by the Spirit of God and dedicated to the will of God. Well, beloved, this same truth applies to us believers today in this world where we find ourselves reeling from culture shock. Anybody here reeling from culture shock? You know, when I, when I was first saved, I began to see a few things happening that were, were leading up to the coming of our Lord. And it seemed like that, you know, every year there'd be two or three things happening. My folks, my, my beloved brethren this morning, I want to say to you, I see two or three things happening every week leading up to the coming of our Lord. It should not be long until we see King Jesus. But we are reeling today. The church is reeling today from culture shock, confused concerning God's will. And so it's important for us to examine What Paul says about Corinth's experience, because Corinth's experience is so much like our own. So let's take a look at what Paul says this morning. Number one, don't be fooled by cultural influences. Don't be fooled by cultural influences. Notice, if you will, in chapter 6, verse 9, he says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Paul is saying here, you guys are going to these folks that are unrighteous, that characteristically they live 
a life that is unrighteous. They're known for it. And you're going to them when you are to be the righteous ones? He says, listen, do not be deceived. Now, I want you to underline that. Do not be deceived because we're being deceived today in so many ways. We're buying into this thing that God just doesn't care. It's all of grace and God doesn't care. It is all of grace, but God cares. Don't ever be fooled. Do not be deceived. Once again, Paul is disappointed with the church here at Corinth because they had not only turned to the world for advice in legal manners, matters, but they had turned to the world for moral direction. They had forgotten that the people, as Paul describes here, whose, whose lives characteristically were unrighteous, would not inherit the kingdom of God. And here's what he's saying. Here's what he means by this. Why are you going to these people who are living opposed to the will of God, who are not going to, to go to heaven? Why are you using them as your examples, people of God bound for heaven? He says you shouldn't be. You shouldn't be emulating them. Now on through the rest of this verse and through verse 10, he gives us a description of what is unrighteous. And we could stand a reminder of that in our day to day. So let's just go down the list here. You know, look at the first word here. Fornication or fornicators. Now the minute I said that, I'm sure some of you had to fight chuckling. Because in our world today, comedians and everybody else makes fun of this word fornicator. I want to tell you something. God's not laughing. It's a serious matter to him. And they've made jokes about it in our world today, but it's still terrible, and we shouldn't be joking about it. We should be avoiding it. Now, here's what the word fornication means. It means premarital sex. It means anyone who is living with somebody and not married is committing this sin. And I know today, we, we, we live in a day where living together without being married is not considered wrong. Folks, I love you. I'm your pastor. And I'm not, I don't mean any disparagement to anybody, but it's wrong. It's wrong. You see how popular that is today? But not only is it premarital sex, it's adultery. It includes adultery. And then... This word fornication includes all other kinds of immoral sex. Number two, idolaters. And this doesn't just mean the folks who actually worship images like folks in India and Africa and Japan and many other nations that literally bow down uh, to stone and wood and metal images and worship these images and bring them gifts. I was watching a special on uh, PBS the other day where it just showed folks they were having this big holiday and they were bringing all of these elaborate sacrificial gifts to this hunk of stone. And the stone had no way of knowing that it was receiving gifts. I thought how foolish, how silly. But here's what you need to understand here. The word idolatry here is not just about those who worship stone images. It's about anybody who puts anything before God. And we need to be reminded about that today. Folks, when I say putting anything before God, I'm talking about anything, listen carefully, that you give more devotion to than you give to God is an idol. Now today I'm going to talk about sins that some of you are, are going to get upset with me. I'm certain of that in a, in a crowd this large. But I want you to understand here, we all have something to answer for if you'll look closely at this list. And what Paul wants us to understand is this. God knows that we all fall short, but he does not want us to get to the place to where we accept it. He just wants us to get to the place to where we recognize where we've fallen short. We ask forgiveness, and when we depend on the power of God to go out and live a godly life. It's not wrong for us to recognize today that one of these things on this list could enter into our life through, through the week. It could enter into our mind. We could be tempted by it, of course. What is wrong is when we just continue to give in 
and consider it as okay. Why? Because the culture now says it's okay. Just because someone passed a law, just because some court, court says something's all right, doesn't make it all right. The only court that you and I tend, want to obey is the Word of God Almighty. Every Christian should be a good citizen. Every Christian should obey the laws of the land until those laws of the land go against the Word of God. And then we have to do like Peter and say, I can only obey God, not men. Now let's look at the next one, adulterers. Now this gets real specific, and this is talking about the person who is married and who is unfaithful to his spouse or her spouse. But Jesus, when he came, now in the, in the Old Testament it was clear what adultery was. If you were married and you were unfaithful to your spouse, it was obvious that you were committing adultery. But Jesus comes along, and Jesus had this tendency. Have you ever noticed the Sermon on the Mount and many things that he said? Jesus had the tendency of taking it beyond the law and into the heart. And Jesus said, let me take this a little further. Not only is it wrong to commit adultery on your spouse, but it's wrong, listen, to even look at a woman and desire to be involved with her sexually. There's a word for that today, and it's available at the touch of a key on your computer, or your phone, or your television. It's called pornography. And all of a sudden, our society, our culture has begun more and more to accept pornography everywhere you look. It's, it's seeping into even regular television programming. The thought of it, making jokes about it. And listen to me, especially young people, always remember this. When the devil wants to introduce something new into society, he will begin not by showing it for what it really is. He's never going to do that. No, listen, remember this. If he wants something that we see as repulsive, as wrong, as totally against God, he will introduce it into society through comedy. He'll get you laughing about it. I want you to do something for me, young people and mom and dad and everybody else alike. I want you to get a notebook out, and when you're watching regular sitcoms on television, put down the times that jokes are made either directly or indirectly about pornography. This same thing happened in our society concerning something else I'll be talking about in just a moment. It was introduced into our society through comedy. Comedy shows. In fact, there's a show coming back this fall that uh, was a main, a main uh, instrument in getting us to accept a certain sin that we'll talk about here in a moment. And it came to us through comedy. The devil gets you laughing about it, because if you laugh about something, you'll get the opinion it's not quite that bad if you can laugh about it. So please be aware. And the next one's the big one. Homosexuals. There's two words here. Paul says homosexuals and sodomites. The word homo homosexuals, and I'm, and I'm sure I'm pronouncing this wrong. I am certain I am, but it's malachi. Well, I kind of, that's the Greek. That, is, that speaks of female homosexuals. The next word is, is catamites in the Greek. And that speaks of male homosexuals. Sometimes the first word, malachi, is interpreted as effeminate. And it not only means those that, that consider themselves as lesbians, but it also means in a homosexual relationship where the male takes on the role of a female toward the other male. Catamite, effeminate, that's what that means. Homosexuals and sodomites. And what's so terrible about this sin is it's going against the natural use of the body in marriage, lusting after the same sex. It goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 1. All the way back to 1 through 3 where God talks about his ideal for marriage. One man, one woman for life. And children are to be a result of their union. I'm reading a book now, and I'm going to recommend it to you. You'll see it there on the outline in just a moment. 
by Albert Moeller. And he goes back and says, before we start to pick on anybody else, let's pick on ourselves. Because we're the ones who a long time ago began to, listen, separate sex from having children. We don't even think usually of sex as having children. And he said we have done it through, through some forms of contraception. That's for another sermon someday. We've done it through divorce. And in the 70s, we did it by glamorizing hooking up. We've made sex recreational instead of procreational. You don't always have to have children every time that you have a relationship with your wife, but it ought to be understood that that was God's original purpose. And as we've separated that from sex, we've gone slowly farther and farther away until we've come to where we are today. Look what Romans 1, in case you say, well, I don't believe that that's what those words mean. Well, okay, then look at Romans 1, 26 through 27. Paul said he, makes, he gives it in detail here. For even their women exchange the natural use for what is against nature. Against nature. Against the way God ordered the world. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men, committing what is shameful. This is not a Baptist preacher saying this. This is the Apostle Paul. So don't be deceived, young people. Don't be deceived, mom and dad. Don't be deceived, any of you, by the propaganda that's been meted out on television, magazines, books, articles, in our schools, and even by our politicians. The Word of God has not changed. And God said in His words, I do not change. God doesn't change. Culture may change, but God doesn't change. And the truth of his word doesn't change. And we better not change either. So homosexuality is a sin. And it's not an acceptable lifestyle for believers. And once again, I beg you. I beg you as your pastor. If you've ever wanted to do anything for me, do this. Buy this book, We Cannot Be Silent by Robert Moeller, M-O-H-L-E-R. He goes back and traces the entire history of how our culture got to where it is today. Now, now, you say, well, maybe you're, you're here today and you say, well, I, I should have known you Christians hate gays. Not true at all. Not true at all. And we're going to prove that with a series we're starting this Wednesday night. I need for you to sign up because we want to see if we have more than enough. Uh, we have a certain classroom reserved, but if we have more than that, we'll come right back to the auditorium. But we are going to do a series called Messy Grace. In this series, we will have testimonies of people that have struggled with homosexuality and are still struggling with homosexuality. But the main premise that we're going to be covering in this is the, the one who is going to be leading the discussion in this DVD presentation is one whose parents were gay. This fellow's parents were gay. And then at a certain point, they divorced and the father left the home. This fellow stayed with his mother, of course. And he tells the story how he came to, guess what city? Kansas City, with his mother for a gay and lesbian parade. In that parade, as they were he was marching with his mother, I think he was about seven at this time, folks from the Westboro, and I can't even make myself say it, Baptist Church, they're about as Baptist as Hitler. I said they're about as Baptist as Hitler. <laughs> Amen. They were holding up signs, talking about how they hated homosexuals. And he said to his mom, why are they doing that? And listen to what she said. She said, well, son, it's because Christians hate homosexuals. Do we hate homosexuals? No. 
No, we do not. This young man, when he grew up, got into high school. He went to a high school Bible study. Can you believe that? With one purpose in mind, to learn enough to disprove Christianity. He just wanted to learn enough to stand up against this, this religion that hated him and his parents. Well, you know how God works. You know how God works. He got in there, and those teenagers loved on him, and he got exposed to the Word of God and got saved. I'm not done yet. And then he became a preacher. He went to Ozark Christian College. Talbot College. He's now presently enrolled at Dallas Theological Seminary. He also, after graduating from Talbot College, he went down to Dallas, Texas and became a pastor. And guess what? Mom and dad followed him to his church and get ready for it and got saved. This film series, it's only four weeks, carve it out of your schedule. This film series is about his life and his association with this community. And what he says is this, what he says is this, I love this. He says, this story is about how a pastor with gay parents learned to love others without sacrificing his convictions. Beloved, that's what the world doesn't understand. We can love them without sacrificing our convictions, and we do love them. We mean no harm to them. We're not trying to take anything away from them, but we reserve the right to tell them the truth. We reserve the right to tell them the truth. And so I want to beg you to come this Wednesday night, get involved in this series. If you are struggling with this yourself, please come and hear these folks out. Everyone in this film has either been involved in this community or is still involved in this community. I want you to come. If you are without answers for people you work with, come and learn how to respond to these folks in love. If you have somebody in your family or whatever, come and learn how to respond in love to these folks. But we cannot cave just because the culture caved. The next one's thieves. This is anybody who takes something that doesn't belong to them. If it doesn't belong to you, you're stealing. Covetous people. Now, this is amazing. Isn't it amazing? We would read this long list here, and we'd say, yeah, yeah. Most of us say, yeah, yeah, until we get to this one. And even if we did say, yeah, we have our own version of what that is. You know what covetous means? It means you always want more. You're never satisfied with what you have. You say, how can I know if I have a covetous sp spirit? If you put your family in horrible debt to get something that you wanted, because you just had to have it. If you do something illegal to have something, it, you, listen, you say, well, that's, you're talking about rich people. No, no. You can be poor as Job's turkey and be covetous. Job's turkey is pretty poor. <laughs> if you can imagine. You can be covetous if you spend your day always dissatisfied. Anybody, don't, don't raise your hand and please don't punch your neighbor. <laughs> but do any of you know people like that? You know, they get, they, they get a new Chevy and they got to have a Cadillac. They get a Cadillac and they got to have a whatever. I mean, where do you go from there? A Rolls Royce, I guess. <laughs> Never, ever satisfied. Now, folks, listen. Did you catch what I'm saying here? We've all at one point wrestled probably a little bit with this. And so we don't have the right to point our fingers at anybody else on this list and say, you're so terrible and I'm so good. Did you hear me? Can I hear an amen? amen. Turn to your neighbor. We've said it before, but turn to your neighbor and say, I'm a mess. Now turn back to him and say, and so are you. <laughs> How many of you said you're a bigger mess than me? I, I just... Careful now. Now let's go with drunkenness. 
This is simply anybody addicted to alcohol and drugs, but I found something unique about this term drunkenness here. It's amazing. In the Greek, this word here speaks of getting drunk in order to lower your inhibitions so that you can participate in sinful sexual acts. Isn't that amazing? This is more than just a regular drunkenness, but drunkenness just the same. Revilers. Most of you probably read this word and said, well, I'm glad that's not me. Do you even know what it means? When was the last time you had somebody come up to me and say, Pah, or come up to you and say, you're a reviler? I doubt anybody's had that. Anybody, is anybody, I'm just curious. Anybody had anybody come up to you and say, I know a reviler? Okay, I didn't think so. Let me help you out here. You know what a reviler is? A reviler is somebody who abuses others, listen, through scolding, ranting, raving, or cursing. How you doing, Mom and Dad? How you doing, young people? How are you doing, you bullies? who use language because you don't have enough guts to live a life that you ought to live and you just throw the words out there saying to somebody, I'll get you before you get me. How you doing? Ranting, raving, even that, Paul says, is sin. Extortioners, that's taking money and things by either schemes or force. Taking advantage of the poor, the unsuspecting, sometimes even your own family and friends, extortioners. So we have this long list here. And Paul says every one of these are sins. And Paul is saying, listen, you're going out and finding people where this is their lifestyle. And you're asking them for advice? Folks, you say, well, I would never do that. Oh, you, really? Really? Think about, think about the majority of the music you listen to. Could, I, could we dare to say that a lot of these subjects are covered in that? Think about the news programs you listen to. Could we dare say that there is some news organizations that would lean toward saying these are okay? Paul said, you don't get your advice about culture. You don't get your advice about your behavior. You don't get your advice about living for God. You don't get your definition of grace and freedom and liberty from them. But that's what we're doing. Politician says it. He's in our party. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. Movie star says it, and we like them. Oh, I, I've always loved their movies. They're, they're so cute, and I mean, and we take it. Song comes on promoting all kinds of lasciviousness, and we say, I've always liked that artist, and boy, the beat's good. Yeah, I'll take that. Look what Paul says. And such, say it with me, were some of you but you were washed, but you were sanctified, means set apart. You were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Paul says, this used to be you, but you've been washed. You've been cleansed. You've had this washed out of your life. You've been sanctified. You have been set apart from the world to be something different other than the world. And then he says, you've been justified. You've been declared righteous before God because of your new life in Jesus Christ. Now, we come to verse 12, and, it, and all of a sudden it looks like Paul's changed his mind. Look at this. All things are lawful for me. <laughs> what the, isn't that the attitude of the age? But all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. I want you to notice here, Paul's not contradicting himself. He didn't just spend all this time talking about these specific sins and telling us how wrong they are to simply say now, but you can go out and do what you want to. doesn't matter. Because for the Christian, everything's lawful. Now, what Paul is saying is, folks, listen to me. You do have liberty. 
When he says, all things are lawful to me, what, what do we think about when we think of the word lawful as believers? And we think about the Old Testament, what are we thinking when we think of the word lawful? Can we be thinking about the law? <laughs> That's what Paul's thinking about. And Paul's saying, you're right. Under grace in Jesus Christ, we don't have to offer sacrifices at the temple. We don't have to observe all the days that the Jews observed. We don't have to go through all the cleansings the Jews went through. We, don't ha- we, we are not bound to all that. We can eat pork. Paul is saying, all things are lawful for me. But he says, let me tell you something. There is something about Christian liberty that's different from any other liberty. And you, and you need to understand this. Paul says, God has given us liberty. We're not required to observe rituals and regulations of the law. But liberty does not mean doing what we please. In fact, Paul says, if you're not careful, you'll become enslaved by the very thing you wanted freedom to do. I don't care what mom and dad said. I I can handle that drug. I'll, I'll just try it. And then you become a slave to the very thing you thought was freedom. Remember that Bobby McGee, freedom is just another word for nothing left to lose. (laughs) Isn't that about the truth? What some people call freedom looks a whole lot like a prison to the rest of us. He says, the so-called, think about this, in our experience, the so-called freedom of the sexual revolution actually led to bondage. Back in the 70s when the Well, it started in the 60s, but it culminated full force in the 70s, a sexual revolution. I'll never forget, right after I was saved, I was saved in the 70s, and and an old drinking buddy of mine came to where I I was working at Sears, and he came to me, and he he said, "Uh, hey, man, I heard you got religion. And I said, no, you heard wrong. He said, really? I said, I got Jesus. Big difference. A relationship, not a religion. Oh, okay, well, whatever. Uh, man, you ought to, uh, you, you, your timing's lousy. You ought to be out here now. It's all free. You can have all the sex you want. You can do anything you want, man. He said, you, you don't know what you're missing. I was waiting for that moment. I said, you know what? You're right. I don't know what I'm missing. I miss being drug out of the snow while I'm laying in my own vomit after having puked up all the whiskey I drank that night. I miss that a lot. I said, you know what, buddy? The only thing I miss, the only thing I'm missing is misery. (laughs) That's all I'm missing. The world lies to you. The devil lies to you. And he tells you that all these things will free you. They're good. They're so wonderful. It's, It's a lie. Paul says, be careful. Just because you're not under the law anymore, you are under her the law of Christ, leadership of the Spirit of God. Now, I'm going to stop here because this is way too important of a subject, and I've spent way too much time emphasizing parts of this, and I don't want you to miss out on this next part because it's so important. So we'll we'll pick up here in verse 13 next week. Let's bow for prayer. Oh, Father, in the name of Jesus, please, please, May anybody who's listening to my voice today in this auditorium or who may listen in the future by recording or whatever, Father, in the name of Jesus, may they know my heart. I know what it's like to be tempted. I know what it's like to feel the pull of sin so strongly that you, you, you just think that, that there, there is nothing in you that can resist. I know what that feels like. I know what it feels like to be confused about what's right and wrong sometimes. I know what it's like. I know what it's like to sometimes wonder if what I believe may be a little off. But, oh, Father, I also know what it's like to come back to the Word of God and over and over and over again be reassured. No, this is the truth. Just because culture's changed doesn't mean that it's changed. Oh, Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that if there's anybody here today that's struggling with any of these things I mentioned today, 
and they've given in to them and they've even begun to live it and they've even begun to deceive themselves into thinking it's okay oh father I pray in the name of Jesus that that the very blood that you shed on Calvary that in their heart and their soul I'll be they'll be able to see it trickling down that they'll look into your face They'll look into your face and they'll stop listening to what the teacher said. They won't listen to what the politician said. They won't listen to what the news outlet said. They won't listen to what entertainment said. They won't listen to what culture is screaming every day. But they will look, they will say, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, I'm about to go crazy here. Tell me what is the truth. Oh, Lord, I pray that you'll whisper sweetly into their soul and their heart what you said in John 14, 6. I am the truth. I'm the way. I'm the life. Father, shake us. Shake us out of our blindness. Shake us out of our lethargy. Shake us out of our apathy. Shake us out of our sinfulness. Bring us back to the truth. May we start taking every thought into captivity, into the captivity of Jesus Christ. May we refuse to buy in to what somebody else said just because they're more popular than me or make more money than me or wear a black robe and say they're supreme. May we look to the one who wears the white robe and is supreme. May we come to the altar and throw ourselves upon you and be reminded that you are the truth and the life and the way to freedom. You are a chain breaker. You are a way maker. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Lord, as the world races so quickly toward the end, so quickly toward destruction, I'm reminded that you said in the scriptures that because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. And Lord, all across the, the world I see churches caving to culture and their love for you waxing cold. And it doesn't surprise me that one of the first chapters in the book of Revelation, talking about the end times, when you had to rebuke the church, you said, I'm upset with you because you're neither hot. You're neither cold. You're just lukewarm. I'm about to spew you out of my mouth because you've gotten to the point where you just don't care. Oh, Father, bring us back. Bring us back. Clean out our minds. Clean out our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray.